Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to talk to you about what's happening in the Russian economy and specifically to talk about payment problems that Russia is now encountering with regards to the sale of its oil products. Almost immediately after Russia invaded Ukraine in February 2022, financial sanctions were applied against Russia. However, over the last two years, those financial sanctions have continued to be increased. And what we're seeing now is that Russia is finding it very difficult to actually get cash from the countries that it's delivering oil to. So in today's video, we'll go through the details as to who Russia's biggest customers are right now, who's actually still buying Russian oil products. We'll then talk about what's happening with the payment systems because the USA and the European Union are closing down all of the loopholes and making it much more difficult for financial institutions to actually continue making those payments. And this is obviously having a big impact on Russia's cash flow. We'll then talk about what's happening with India, because if you've been following the channel, you'll know that India has reduced the amount of oil that it's buying from Russia significantly as a result of the increase in the sanctions. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary as to what I think the implications of these increased financial sanctions are for Russia and what's likely to happen over the course of the next three to six months. But before we get started on all of that, I'd like to say thank you so much to everyone that's supporting the channel. I really, really appreciate it. If you've bought me a coffee or sent me a YouTube super thanks, thank you for the time and effort that you've taken to do that. Really means a lot to me. And if you've signed up as a long-term supporter of the channel, either through Patreon or YouTube membership or buy me a coffee membership, thank you. It really helps to keep me motivated and makes me think up more videos to post every single day. So really appreciate your support. And if you'd like a fun way of supporting the channel, why don't you think about buying a ticket in the raffle that I'm having right now for this guy, Stiltman, which is one of the original sculptures that's been showing on Joe Blogs for over three years. Now, as I'm sure you'll be aware if you follow the channel, over the last two years, since the invasion of Ukraine started, there has been an enormous shift in terms of which countries are buying Russian oil. And this chart shows which countries Russia has earned the most money from since the beginning of the war up until the 17th of March 2024. And as you can see, right at the top of this list is the European Union, which has paid over 188 billion euros which is around $210 billion since the start of the war. And as you can see in terms of the breakdown, over half of that figure was paid for oil purchases, around 45% was paid for natural gas, and the remainder was paid for coal. Russia's second biggest customer since the start of the war is China, who so far have paid around 174 billion euros, or around $190 billion to Russia for the purchase of oil, gas and coal. Russia's third biggest purchaser is India, having paid around 78 billion euros or around 86 billion dollars. And the vast majority of those purchases have related to oil. Russia's fourth largest customer is Turkey, having paid around 65 billion euros or 71 billion dollars. Five on the list is Germany, followed by the Netherlands, Italy, South Korea, Hungary, France, Belgium, Malaysia, United Arab Emirates, Poland, Japan, Slovakia, Greece, Spain, Brazil and Bulgaria. Now these total purchase figures obviously cover the entire period since the start of the war, but it's important to have a look at what's been happening in terms of the change of customer base that Russia has experienced over that period. This chart shows the breakdown of Russia's customers for crude oil sales dating back to January 2022, and we've got five different colours on this chart. The blue section, which is very small at the bottom of the graph, are sales to Brazil. The red section are sales to China. The orange section sales to India. The grey section, other countries, predominantly the European Union, historically. And the green section at the top are sales to Turkey. And what this chart shows is that over the last two years, there has been a significant shift in terms of who's buying Russian oil. Back in January 2022, which was the month before the war started, Russia's biggest single customer was the European Union, as a result of the fact that it's close in terms of proximity, and also Russia had constructed a network of pipelines that delivered crude oil directly to a lot of these countries, and that meant that it was very efficient and low cost for those countries to be able to buy oil from Russia. 
However, because of the war in Ukraine, a lot of the European countries turned around and said that they no longer wanted to buy Russian oil. And you can see that by the end of 2022, the purchases from the other countries, predominantly the European Union, had reduced significantly. And at the same time, there had been a significant increase in the volume of purchases from India. In the first few months of 2022, India purchased virtually no oil from Russia. However, because of the large discounts that Russia was offering to India, and also the fact that India didn't feel that it was under any pressure in terms of the sanctions, India started buying huge volumes, and this led to a significant shift in Russia's customer base. And you can see that by the end of 2022, Russia's two largest customers were India and China. India had actually overtaken China at that point. And this situation continued throughout the majority of 2023. However, in October, the USA decided that it needed to step up the policing of the sanctions, that far too much Russian oil was being sold above the price cap of $60 per barrel. And the USA deliberately targeted a variety of tankers and companies that were involved in the shipping of Russian oil, who were bending the rules, who were saying that basically a lot of the cost related to transport costs and not to the price per barrel. And as a direct result of that increase in the policing, lots more companies were sanctioned. And in response to the increase in policing, India started purchasing less oil from Russia. And in terms of who Russia's largest purchasers of fossil fuels are today, this chart shows the five countries that bought the most in February 2024. And as you can see, China is Russia's largest customer by a long way. In February, it purchased around 7.5 billion euros worth of fossil fuels, which is around $8.3 billion. Russia's second largest customer now is Turkey, who bought a combination of crude oil, refined oil products, pipeline gas and coal, and purchased around 3 billion euros, which is around $3.5 billion worth of fossil fuels. In February, India was still Russia's third largest customer, purchasing around 2 billion euros, around $2.2 .2 billion worth of fossil fuels. And the vast majority of those purchases related to crude oil. Interestingly, the European Union is still Russia's fourth largest customer, despite all of the sanctions being in place. And these purchases relate predominantly to countries that are still struggling to be able to find alternative suppliers of fuel that's coming from Russia. So countries that are generally landlocked, that don't have access to the coast, and therefore are finding it difficult, particularly to source gas products. And in February, the European Union paid around $2 billion to Russia for the purchase of those products. And Russia's fifth largest customer is Brazil, who are purchasing refined oil products. And what this analysis shows us is that Russia has a high exposure to China, Turkey, and India, who purchased around $14 billion worth of fossil fuels from Russia in February. Now, if you've been following the channel, you'll know that I've reported recently on problems that Russia have been encountering in terms of making deliveries to both India and Turkey, who are very concerned about the increase in the sanctions. And up until now, China has been completely oblivious to everything that's going on. It's just been ignoring the sanctions and carrying on trading with Russia as if nothing was happening. However, that looks like it's starting to change as Russia is now struggling to collect oil payments from China, the United Arab Emirates and Turkey, who are all now concerned about increased policing of the financial sanctions. Russian oil firms are facing delays of up to several months to be paid for crude oil and refined oil products as banks in China, Turkey and the United Arab Emirates become more wary of US secondary sanctions. Several banks in China, the United Arab Emirates and Turkey have boosted their sanctions compliance requirements in recent weeks, resulting in delays or even the rejection of money transfers to Moscow. Banks cautious of the US secondary sanctions have started to ask their clients to provide written guarantees that no person or entity from the US special designated nationals list is involved in a deal or is a beneficiary of a payment. In the United Arab Emirates, banks First Abu Dhabi Bank and Dubai Islamic Bank have suspended several accounts linked to the trading of Russian goods. The UAE's Mashrek Bank, Turkey's Zirat and Zakif Bank and Chinese banks ICBC and Bank of China still process payments but are taking weeks or months to process them. Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov, when recently asked whether banks in China have slowed payments, said, of course, 
Unprecedented pressure from the United States and the European Union on the People's Republic of China continues. This of course creates certain problems, but cannot become an obstacle to the further development of our trade and economic relations with China. The increase in financial sanctions predominantly relates to a US Treasury executive order that was published on December the 22nd, 2023, which warned it could apply sanctions for the evasion of the Russian price cap on foreign banks and called on them to boost compliance. This order was the first direct warning about the possibility of secondary sanctions on Russia, putting it on a par with Iran in some areas of trade. Following the US order, Chinese, UAE and Turkish banks that work with Russia have increased checks, started asking for extra documentation and trained more staff to make sure deals were compliant with the price caps. Additional documents can also include details of the ownership of all companies involved in the deal and personal data of individuals controlling the entities so that banks can check on any exposure to the SDN list. At the end of February, United Arab Emirates banks had to raise payment scrutiny as they were asked to provide data to the US Correspondent Bank and the US Treasury if they have transactions that go to China on behalf of a Russian entity. This has meant delays in processing payments to Russia and one trader was quoted as saying, it has become tough and not even for the dollar transactions. Sometimes it takes weeks for a direct Chinese yuan to ruble transaction to be executed. If you've been following the channel, you'll know that I recently posted a video talking about the fact that Russia's largest shipping company, Sovcomflot, was hit directly with sanctions. And as a result of that, India's largest private refinery business called Reliance had decided that it no longer wanted to take any deliveries that were being transported by the company. And in terms of an update on that situation, it's now been reported that every refinery in India has followed suit so none of them are taking any deliveries from Russia's largest shipping company. Private and state-run oil processing businesses, including India's largest, Indian Oil Corp, have stopped taking cargoes if they're on Sovcomflot tankers. The refinery businesses are also scrutinizing the ownership of each ship to make sure that they're not affiliated with the company or other sanctioned groups. And this chart shows the total number of oil tankers delivering Russian Urals oil to India dating back to January 2023. And the scale on the right hand side of this chart shows the number of tankers and goes from zero at the bottom to 80 at the top. And we've got two colors showing on these bars. The black section at the bottom relates to Sovcomflot oil tankers and the blue section are non-Sovcomflot ships. And what this shows is that between January and May 2023, there was a significant increase in the number of tankers delivering Euros oil to India. However, May 23 was the peak period, and since that time, the deliveries have been reducing. And if we look at the black section at the bottom, which details the number of Sovcomflot ships, you can see that the figure peaked in October 2023. And since that time, the numbers have been reducing. And in March 2024, there were only two deliveries. And as we've just discussed, India has now come out and said that it will no longer accept any Sovcomflot deliveries. And one of the worrying things from Russia's point of view is what's happening with total deliveries. In the period up to October 23, India was receiving deliveries from around 60 oil tankers per day of Ural's oil. However, since the policing of the sanctions has been tightened, the situation has changed. And as you can see, in February, there were only around 45 tankers delivering per day. And in March, that figure had dropped to around 25. So this represents a significant fall in the volume of oil that India is buying from Russia. And that's going to cause Russia a major problem because it doesn't have any other major large countries to be able to substitute those lost sales to. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because I think what's happening right now in terms of the policing of the sanctions against Russia is one of the biggest news events since the sanctions were first applied against the country. Immediately following the invasion of Ukraine, the European Union and the West turned their back on Russia. They stopped buying all of those oil products. And at that point, that looked like it could be a major problem from Russia's point of view. However, Russia successfully managed to pivot and start selling huge volumes direct to India, which actually saved the Russian oil industry because Russia doesn't have anywhere to store its oil. So as it's pulling nine or 10 million barrels of oil from the ground every single day, it needed to find somebody to buy that oil 
Otherwise, the other option that Russia had was to cut back on the production flows, and that could have caused major problems for them further down the road if they tried to get those flows going again. So the fact that Russia was able to do deals with India, albeit at a huge discount to the market price, meant that the Russian oil industry could carry on as it had been, producing the same sort of volumes. However, over the last six months, we've started to see things changing because the USA and the West have started policing the sanctions much more heavily. So they're focusing in on the financial institutions, the banks who are processing the payments, and telling them that if they find that anybody involved in any of these trades has been sanctioned, then that's going to lead to secondary sanctions on all of those institutions. And obviously, if you're a bank, you don't want to run that risk. All banks have compliance departments and they have to do everything by the letter of the law. So if you get something in from the USA warning you, you will have to set up processes and systems to be able to check every single thing. And what we've talked about in today's video is that it's not just the companies that have been sanctioned that banks have to worry about. They now also have to look at who the shareholders of those companies are, who owns those businesses. So you can't just hide behind a limited company and say, well, actually, it's me, but I'll set up a limited company and it won't really matter because that limited company hasn't been sanctioned. The banks now have an obligation to check who owns those companies, and if it's somebody who's been sanctioned, then they have to stop those payments. And the problem that banks have is that thousands and thousands of Russians are now on that sanctioned list. So this is a very time-consuming process. Somebody has to go through and check every single shareholder of every single company that's involved in the chain on all of these deals. And as you can imagine, that's taking a huge amount of time. And what we've seen today is that it's now holding up the actual payments that are due to Russia. So Russia's still making the deliveries, it's still pumping the oil, it's still sending all of that oil to places like India and China, but it's not being paid. And obviously that's one of the key objectives of the sanctions, to cut out the cash flow that Russia is earning from the sale of all of its fossil fuels. So the new policing is definitely having an impact. And what we've talked about today is for the first time, China is now being hit with these sanctions. Chinese financial institutions that obviously are still dealing with the West, are still doing lots of transactions, are now being brought into this loop. So they're having to set up compliance systems and go through and check everything. So as a result of all of this increased paperwork and checking, Russia's cash flows have now been severely impacted. And as we go forward, it's likely that this situation will get worse and worse. And also what we've talked about today is that India is now taking a step back. As a result of the increased policing, India is now becoming very concerned. A lot of companies don't want to lose their trade that they're doing with the rest of the world because Russia is a relatively small country in terms of what it's purchasing. It only has a population of around 145 million. So obviously from India's point of view, they're a major exporter. They sell lots of things to lots of different countries. So the vast majority of India's trade is not with Russia. India is buying oil from Russia, but there isn't really a two-way flow. Russia isn't buying a lot from India. That's one of the reasons why Russia refused to take payments in Indian rupees, because there wasn't a lot of two-way trade that they could use to spend those rupees on. So what we've got now is a situation where India is starting to reduce the amount of oil that it's purchasing from Russia, and that's now having a huge impact because Russia simply doesn't have any other major large countries to be able to turn to to make those sales. So if India does cut back on all of its purchases from Russia, that's going to put Russia in a very sticky situation. And what we've seen over the last 12 months is that Russia has announced two voluntary cutbacks of 500,000 barrels per day. So that obviously equates to a 1 million barrel per day reduction in the production of oil from Russia. And if India decides that it's going to stop purchasing all oil from Russia, that would mean a further cutback of around another million barrels per day, and means that Russia would therefore probably have to announce another production cutback. And all of this will lead to major problems for Russia, because if you continue reducing the amount that you're pulling out of the ground, at some point in the future when you try to fire up those flows again, you're going to encounter problems. And as we've talked about lots of times before, Russia is currently struggling in terms of it's lost all of its partners, companies like ExxonMobil, BP and Shell have all exited Russia, so Russia doesn't have that expertise on site anymore. It's also lost access to all of the technology, 
So Russia is now dealing with technology that's more than two years old in a lot of these facilities, and that's going to cause them a problem. And also it's lost access to capital because those companies were investing billions of dollars into the Russian oil industry every single year. So Russia really doesn't want to cause any problems for itself in terms of production, but that's exactly what's happening right now. And the overall summary of today's video is that the increased policing of the sanctions is now really starting to hurt Russia. Banks in China, India, Turkey and the UAE are all now having to go through extra processes, extra checks to make sure that nobody involved in any of these deals has been sanctioned. That's causing delays in those payments, that's reducing Russia's cash flow. And in addition to that, India is now pulling back from its purchases from Russia. And all of this is bad news for the Russian economy and could lead to major problems over the course of the next three to six months. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's video, you found it useful, informative and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face. I've got some really exciting news for you. I've decided to give away another one of my statues. And this time, it's this guy, the man on stilts. Now, if you've been watching my channel, you'll know that this is one of the original pieces that I've been showing in the background for the last few years. This is a truly amazing piece. I absolutely love it. And it's made by a British artist called Paul Moggetts. And he makes a limited number of each one of his pieces. And I've managed to secure a second one of these but I'm giving this one away, which is the original one that I've had in the background for the last few years. And if you'd like to win it, you just need to buy a ticket in the raffle, which are priced at one pound each, which is around $1.30. So very affordable. So if you'd like to support the channel, rather than buying me a coffee or sending me a YouTube super thanks, why don't you buy a ticket in the raffle and you could have this in your home some point soon. Now, in terms of organizing this, I've got an independent company to collect the cash and make the draw for me. So I won't be choosing it. It will be entirely at random. And I will post this anywhere in the world to whoever wins it. There is a possibility that you may need to pay a little bit of import duty depending on where you live and what the rules are. But I will send this anywhere. So if you'd like to win it, please buy a ticket in the raffle and good luck.